education there. Um, so I'll stop there. I think that's a little overview and probably there went too long, but um, I'm happy to take any questions. I would say that the most horrifying building is the Park Royal Pickering Hotel on Pickering. <laughs> Woo! You know, which I think is um, it's it's really amazing. Uh, it's like the Hanging Gardens of Babylon, right? But one of the things I love about Woha is their total inability to put down their pencil. Like they draw until there's no budget left and no space left, and every single thing has got dripping flowers or a feature wall. And it does everything to kind of break down the building as a singular object, which of course they're doing very intentionally because Richard has an obsession with architecture that's just a byproduct of codes, right? I mean, what's very interesting about that is we, we have this massively over-regulated architecture industry in Singapore. And they basically say, give us all the regulations and we'll just throw them onto the side and we'll see what kind of a building gets generated. It's a very interesting, kind of cynical, very cool approach. And then, after doing that, they kind of cover everything with this intensive vegetation, which is, I think, kind of a an amazing, as an urban object, I think it's really incredible. Also, the fact that so much of what's important about it is actually raised off of the street in a very kind of anti-urban way is very interesting as well. So I put my money on that. Though we have others. Yeah, we have our share of cool buildings. Yeah, so Do you mean in terms of the creative endeavors, like how they compare to each other? Uh, yes, and also how there is a parallel that you see between the presentation and the Yeah, um, that's, that's a super interesting question. I think there are probably a few different ones. I mean, what's interesting is I think a lot of architects are frustrated filmmakers or vice versa. There seems to be some weird kinship. Like architects, if they're not architects, very often are either filmmakers or they're chefs. You know, I, I, I'm not exactly sure what the kind of intimate relationship between those are. But um, I think, you know, in in architecture, the creative process very often is something that's kind of highly mediated by markets, by regulations, right? So what we do is it's kind of like, I always think of it a little bit like Houdini, right? You start out in the straitjacket, you kind of make these little moves and you twitch and you dislocate this and eventually like, boom, you know, if you succeed, you, you go free. And if you don't, you kind of get this crapped kind of building, which is just determined by its own requirements rather than by the creative process. So um, it's again, it's a kind of, it's like what the Marquis de Sade said, right? He said the more that you compress people, the more that you are kind of sadistic toward them, the more creative their potentials are, the better we become. So we need cruelty to be creative. And I think like in a weird way that describes a lot of the kind of weird psychology of the architect, right? Is having to kind of think in there. And architects are huge sadomasochists, right? That's the other thing about it. Um, so I think what happens is that the creative process there really has elements put in it which already uh, predispose it towards horrifying conclusions. Like either if you can't manage it, or I think if you can manage it really well. So architects like, for example, Gary comes up with these tricks that have to do with taking very strange kind of LA urban regulations and his own creative desires and um, movies he's seen and David Lynch is in his mind. And, you know, and he's taking all of that together and kind of playing with quaintness and, and often trying to be idiotic. Like he, he uses the word duh a lot to describe his work. He's like, I like that, it looks so stupid. We, you know, and when people over over sophisticate his details, he doesn't like that. He wants it to look crude in a way. You know, so I think that the it's that kind of strange amalgam of forces that the architect is always dealing with. And now, as those forces get crazier, as our buildings become, you know, bigger, more consolidated, more technically complex, have more requirements applied to them, the number of ways in which the building constrains monstrosity is very, I would say, um, multiplied. Right? I think with filmmakers, it's probably a much more intentional choice. Um, less than something that's imposed on the outside, although I know that they have also a series of kind of absurd criteria that they have to meet if they want to make a movie, but I think film always um, always has that thread of the popular, which again looks toward popular preoccupations we have, right? So for example now, like AI and robotics being a kind of obsession that's coming back, so a lot of the 80s obsession with like AI and robotics and what humans are and our relationship to our devices, like things like Blade Runner, 
you know, so we have an 80s Blade Runner, and now we have Blade Runner 2049, which is like three years ago, so, and Black Mirror, and these things which kind of seem to repeat a kind of cyclical crisis. So I think in order to get people interested, or, or just the filmmakers, like, satisfying their own interests, often has to do with preoccupations and fears. Monsters are a fantastic channel uh, to kind of express a lot of those, right? When we want to look at problems with technology, we have androids, we have cyborgs, we have hybrids, we have, you know, there's, there's a kind of a ready vocabulary. And I think whenever we have kind of mindless consumption, zombies come back. Back, back, you know. I mean, the ones that were made in the 60s and 70s all took place in shopping malls. Like all of those Argento films, they're all like the big scene is always in the shopping mall. And they would often have these scenes where you'd see kind of people lurching through in the beginning and, and you think they were zombies because you're in a zombie movie and they're just mindless consumers like walking past like Radio Shack and the Gap, you know. So I, I think in a way they probably come from different places, but the sense of kind of having to channel a kind of a a zeitgeist or a series of kind of paranoias into a product that then people want to kind of use to think about their lives is probably the common thread. Thanks for the very fascinating presentation. I'm just wondering, uh, it seems from the presentation that every single building has the potential to be read through the lens of being horrified. Yeah. Uh, and I'm just wondering, the converse question to what is the most horrifying building in Singapore is what is the most non-horrifying building in Singapore? That's a really interesting question. Um, it's the most non-horrifying. You know, I think the thing is like that. The, okay, so there's a there's a fantastic Cameroonian philosopher named Ashima Bembe who um, has taken over uh, Jacques, the chair that was occupied by Jacques Derrida in California. It's a theorist, and he talks about a lot about the post colony and he says that the thing about post-colonies is the colonial situation is always monstrous. You know, he, I forget how he says it, because he, he writes incredibly beautifully, so I won't bastardize his text, but basically he says, you know, it's always under the sign of like miscegenations and, and, and forced compromises and, 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 and kind of sadistic actions and violence. It's like there's all of the ingredients of the monstrous are there, and that the colony can never escape the monstrous, right? And so if we think about like, what's probably the thing that offends people the least? Shop houses, shop houses are monstrous as fuck. Have you ever looked at this, like the, the ornament on the front of a shop house? Like it doesn't work at all. It's like somebody who had just seen a classical building and just decided to kind of drew it out. But the thing about it is that it sort of starts to develop its own language, its own ornamental codes, becomes very beautiful, but not because it doesn't have this kind of like awkward history of kind of like throwing together, first of all, the shop and the house, which is like a kind of, it's awkward, right? And now they're very awkward because the URA came in and said, oh no, we can't have people living and selling in the same place. We have to be modern and differentiate functions into different sense, right? So now they're kind of ad agencies and shops or ad agencies and restaurants. So it has a kind of a micro retail kind of sense about it. So it has all kinds of weird instabilities, but I think because we see it as kind of ornamental and charming, that's the kind of the colonial history becomes kind of quaint and desirable and touristic, right? When actually those are super monstrous buildings. The ones I find least monstrous are your probably typical like um, 60s, 70s, like HDB units, which to me have so much kind of rationality and so much clarity to them. And they're, they're, such, they're kind of like, I mean, to the architect, they're like these are the bit of little objects, right? We never get to design anything that's as, as tough as that, right? We, now, it doesn't exist anymore. So something about those to me are very, very comforting, very mobilizing. Um, I, I do a lot of like, a big part of our office is doing kind of social research in various estates. And like, we always find that kind of something about the logic of them quite, quite comforting. But I think by American standards, they're probably terrifying. They break through that whole individualist kind of idea that we like to cherish. So, probably for Americans, there's nothing that's going to this. Maybe, maybe big malls. We're very comfortable with big malls. It's very weird to have to present this book kind of in paraphrase because basically um, monstrous tropes are, are completely promiscuous. Like they don't organize themselves into categories. And there are a lot of buildings we look at and we're like, kind of a Frankenstein, kind of a, you know, like if you look at the, sh the semi detached house where we have like, you know, party owner and like grumpy introvert on the other side, and you know, that gets closer in some ways to exquisite corpse than it does to like a double or a clone. It's just that in some cases we had to make a call and like, well, if it's like two of them, I guess it kind of makes me. More intuitive sense, but monsters totally reject um, that kind of classification into categories. Right? They they hate uh, being ordered because the whole point about them is they're unstable and they're trying to blur categories. They're like the ultimate kind of 
deconstructivist object, right? There are always two things at once or nothing, you know. Um, and, and I think for that reason, like, uh, originally in the book we had a kind of a diagram that was trying to explain, it was almost like a Venn diagram that didn't work, right? <laughs> you have these like overlaps and something that's kind of between, but nothing to me ever kind of is the paradigm of any particular type of monstrosity. I, I think the thing about monstrosity is it doesn't have like paradigmatic typologies. Like, you would never say something is the ultimate exquisite course of the work. There are too many different ways in which that can happen. And for example, like, you know, we used to tie ourselves up in knots trying to, when we were working through the categories of this book, because, you know, some, for example, like some exquisite corpse buildings like the MVRDV kind of Dutch Expo Tower, they really emphasize the lines of collage. Whereas in other places, you see people try and put lots of different things together and they try and smooth it all over with some kind of material or some sort of color or treatment that kind of tries to tie the parts back together into a common kind of body or skin. And those always struck us as being very different, even though the kind of the logic of their production is the same. So there, there are a lot of kind of strange. Um, so I'd say in short, it's a very, um, it's a very unstable and probably hugely unscientific um, categorization. I'm surprised that, uh, well, given that uh, um, we were looking at horror and film and horror a lot this uh, this festival. And that's, uh, well, that's very, been very connected with the idea of the return of the repressed. Mm -hmm. And we're not really, and yeah, we're not really looking so much at sort of, uh, you, you don't really have a horror category that sort of represents that, especially for example, the, the attempts to to go back to old, to more ancient kinds of uh, yeah. architecture, especially with relation to, oh, let's, um, let's, Decolonize architecture by having more sort of uh, Asian or yeah. Yeah, Asian African elements. And uh, yeah, what, like, so how does. There used to be, so the, the book started out like this thick, and now it's this kind of slender beauty that you see before because our press looked at it was like, nobody's going to read that much stuff on the car. So we had a chapter two, um, which was kind of a theme about recrudescence, where we we're looking specifically about nature and nature as a stand-in for age. So in a lot of them, the idea of a kind of, you know, the, the, in architecture we always have this notion, um, it's, it's, it's a completely inaccurate history of, of art as dwelling beginning with a sort of primitive hut where we take leaves and branches and we kind of, you know, it kind of makes the whole thing into an episode. It kind of takes all kind of cultural mediation completely out of the picture. It's a, it's, that is how architecture was taught for most of history until probably a couple of decades ago, was that, you know, people lean tree branches together. So the idea is that nature has always kind of stood for the decline of modern civilization back into some sort of prehistory. And I mean, this is getting into way too much, but this is something else I study a lot with sort of the iconography of landscape in Singapore and the way, you know, our kind of garden city iconography is, has a very specific kind of ambivalent relationship to things like um, tropical jungle, right? as opposed to say like bonsai, which they love. So um, we, we kind of did talk about that with respect to nature to some extent. Um, there, there was also a chapter about the question of out of place, of, of kind of um, the, the history of, say, eclecticism or xenophobia in kind of architectural history, where, for example, like in Scotland, you know, we have cities where they fell in love with this weird um, uh, kind of neo-Egyptian style of neoclassicism. So you go to these cities in Scotland, like Edinburgh, and all of these kind of pyramids and, um, and, and, and columns, you know, very strange kind of like obelisk tower kind of iconography. Um, so there is, there's a bit of that. I mean, I think in the end we tried to, we kind of felt that that deserved its own book, in a way. You know, the, the, idea, the idea of trying to parse out things like cultural appropriation and architectural fear associated with, you know, hybridity in buildings is something that kind of probably needs um, more thought. I think um, when it comes to the, the idea of the return of the repressed, this is um, something I have a little bit of a personal issue with because, I, I mean, my, my thesis research was on uh, ghosts and, and haunted construction sites in Singapore. So specifically, like, looking at the construction se sector and trying to understand why almost none of our projects would go through without some kind of episode where we'd have to have a medium come to the side and get rid of something. You know, there's always stuff going on. And it seemed like wherever the kind of the apex of change and, and disruption would take place, the ghosts were always, like, right there. They were, like, right behind. Um, and, and so I, I kind of spent a little time studying that. But along the way, I kind of tried to move away from the notion of ghosts as always being about the return of repressed history. Because at the same time, what was interesting about it was that there were so many ways in which um, hauntings, kind of horror, spirituality, became a way of thinking about um, the present. 
as well, and thinking about especially like very advanced forms of capital. Right? So we have people that go to graveyards during Ghost Month and with their with their you know 4D numbers, and they put the four 4D numbers on top of the tomb, and they wait and they you know, make offerings, and the last one to fall down was the one that, like they would use. Right? So it was all of this kind of very interesting contemporary stuff. I find that whenever people have written about that, especially in Singapore, it's always about like oh society that moves really fast, so ghosts are about you know, the, the return of repressed history and so on. So I think it's true, but I think it's probably just part of the picture. I'm not sure if that answers. So maybe shall we stop there? I'll stop publicly sweating and move off the stage. So thank you very much for coming. Yeah, thanks everyone for coming down and um, thank you Joshua for that great presentation. Um, you can actually check out Lekka's artwork in Block 2 Level 2 and Lekka Architects also designed the Film History Exhibition at NLB Plaza so do check it out as well. Um, we have a few programs happening next weekend so do visit our website, sailmotion.sg, to register for me. Thank you.